that it was public. I'm, my only my only concern is that uh, we've done away with the higher licensing fees. It looks like we've got the application fee is two hundred fifty dollars. So if we're going to eliminate the higher licensing fees, then I think we need to put a a limit on how many licenses we allow in town. Because the whole point of the original licensing fee was to keep us from becoming, you know, Manchester light. I agree. I, I agree, but I'm wondering if we can postpone that for something in 2024, an early agenda item. Well, I mean, and just get I that mean, part of it done. To be quite honest, I mean, what we heard is negative against business. And so I say open it up. I, I disagree. Exactly. I, I'm with Linda. Maybe. Open it up. Yeah, Let said, everybody in and whatever. Be, I don't think we should be building a nope. a, a little uh, uh, monopoly in town with low license fees and only allowing three people. Well, no, but but if we kept the higher license, the higher initial that fee, would be the you limit the people that can come in. Right. Have a higher initial fee. Initial fee, I thought was $1,400. No, they're changing it to doing 50. away with all No, lines. they're changing it in a year or two fifty, but in, right now it's 1400 and what that's well, doing is it, it was two fifty. Yeah. The initial fee was two fifty. The yearly fee was four hundred. That's that's why I meant. Yeah. So if you lower that, then why limit it? Just right. let everybody in. I agree. Yeah. I think comp competition will take care of the yeah. numbers. Competition you will know. take care of the numbers. Anybody else? I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of that too. I mean, if we're going to lower the fees, but I don't, I don't think. To other folks want to come here and do business. I don't want to be not business friendly. I just want to open nope. it up. And we'll open it up. And in the, the, to your guys' point, you know, it'll naturally serve itself and competition either will take take hold or not. So, yep. Hey, does everybody say what they had to say? I'm under yeah. orders to rush this thing through. So, no. no one else? Anybody on Zoom? Okay, chair will enter. There's a wait, there's a question on Zoom. Is there? Oh no, no, that's that's just the that's just the cursor. Oh, okay. Okay, the chair will enter, entertain a motion in uh item 218. I'd like to make a motion uh to approve the amendment to the marijuana ordinance as presented. All second. Okay, second. Any further discussion? All in favor. Okay. Linda, yep. you favor? Okay. Right. Just for the record, everyone, but. Well, I'm going to say, say all opposed so I can see. All yes. opposed. Okay. Okay. Right. Happy now? There we go. It's not, it's not a matter of whether right. we're happy, it's procedure. Sure. I know. So. But I'm just trying to keep things going. Yeah. All right. So at this point, should we pass the way the second reading? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? <clears throat> okay. You got the hand. All opposed? All opposed. Okay. No, I'm in favor of waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. All right. <laughs> I just happened. I got two first pages. And. We're gone. All right, item 219, consideration of zoning more ordinance amendments uh, to meet requirements of LD 2003. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That was a second reading, I think. Yeah, oh, we we skipped that. that, nobody here from Garden Club. To the end, I think. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. or if they don't show up by the end of the meeting, we're done. We, we won't. Okay. You want to make a discussion yeah. yeah. I have a couple of questions. Okay. So, uh, upon further review of some of the LD 2003 updates, I just have a couple of questions. One of which is uh, what defines a like system for sewer and water? And are we going to include that in here? Um, and then, are we going to instill a process for monitoring Airbnb short term rentals? Is that something separate? Um, okay. Okay, so sorry. I, I want to make sure I understand your question about the sewer and water. Yeah, what is defined as a like system for sewer and water? Whether it's private or public, is that what they're referring to? Yeah, so, Don, do you know? Where are getting that language from? Uh, so I had some of the um, materials from the 2003 
I can get back to you in just a second. Hold on. Yeah. But I have, a, I have a question. Are we talking about February shortening up that overlay to just what was public water and sewer? Right. That's correct. Okay, good. And, yeah. and, and, and just so you folks know, and Don and I were talking about this earlier today, we think that is the skinniest option that you guys have before you yeah. to, to limit the uh, affordable housing. And I, and I want to just say, I'm not against a lot of that. I just want to have time to review it. Yep. We can try to fit this with our guidelines. And the only reason I really kind of like the review a little bit is you know, septic systems and water, and that, that's all good. And when we add to it, I'm just, you put one in, and it could fail three or four years ago. And, and my, my two of my sons are buying homes, both of them failed, failed septics. We just don't know that. So I'm more comfortable if we're going to cause or create expansion that it has a, a system that's going to be able to handle it right now and then have, just have more discussion and more review around that other part of it. So that's where I'm, I'm personally, I like the overlay small right now. So we have time to review it. Yeah. I'm not saying I think it's a bad idea. I just want the time to review it. Right? And, 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 just, and just so you, you know, at our next meeting on January the 8th, planning about the designated growth area so that you guys can start weighing in on how large that you think that should be. Uh, and in fact, got an email today from Joel Green was just suggesting, you know, maybe we start with the 2010 area and expand from there if, if that's the pleasure of the county. The let's, thing with this, with all of those this. developments, I, I just want to try to We can start for your end. A lot of those developments, that is going to trickle down to all the services. So everything has got to have to expand the schools, everything else. When all this huge development comes in, that is what you got to think about. Yeah. And, and so, Linda, though, I think that's the misnomer is we're not talking about large apartment complexes. We're not talking about subsidized housing. We're talking about uh, affordable housing developments. If and there's 100 affordable housing developments, I can guarantee that even if half of them have have kids' schools, school costs will go up. Then the whole it's still thing, based on lot it's size, still based so. on yeah, but the number of units across the entire town, if you know, that's what you've got to consider. Understood. Yeah. And, and of course, this is not across the entire town; it's just for the area. Right now, the it's sure, right. Sure, right. Like, down, that's what I'm saying. Down the road. I yeah. I agree with Linda. If you took a property like the mill. You converted that into affordable rental housing. You know, we could be talking 100 70, units. 100 units. Okay. Yes. No, no. Yes. No, no. Again, uh, think about all the buildings. And, and uh, here, I'm going to read directly from, uh, from the memo. Here. Hold on a second. Hmm? Okay. So, and, and, and I talked to Stephen McDermott about this because I think it was important to get this right and, and because he has a deep understanding of the financing involved with these sort of developments. And at the bottom of page two of the memo, uh, we write, it is unlikely that district would result in large housing developments or apartment complexes. Stephen McDermott explains us that any developer seeking the density bonus must demonstrate financial feasibility before securing finance. That is a more strenuous task when rich rents are indexed to income. And again, this would serve people who earn uh, no more than 80% of the area median income, and the rent could in, uh, take up no more than 30% of their, of their earned income. So Maine Housing, the state's housing finance agency, offers only one financing program that provides subsidy and paying debt for units that can be rented by a household with incomes up to 80% of the area median income. That program, the Rural Affordable Rental Housing Program, limits projects to no more than 18 million. So, so I think I think delay any sort of concerns that we're gonna see these large uh, like and, and I asked uh, Pat Ladd as well. I said, do you think that even a, a feasible possibility for I mean, she said no way. All right. Can I go um Elizabeth? Um, no, I'm I'm fine with the uh, the uh, ordinance as written because we already have reduced our size uh, for the development area. Um, so I'm I'm fine with this. Okay, Ruth. Um, I I just don't like the village application. The lot size thirty five hundred uh, to two thousand five hundred. Square feet. 
and you can put a little house on it and stuff like that. I just think that it's going to become, regardless of whether the sewer and water can handle it, it's just going to, I think, just attract the aspect of where we live. And, and so, okay. another thing going to be in a conversation. Well, here. Shannon, Hi. we'll get back here in a minute. So, okay. so the minimum okay. lot size for the village is, is 3,500 square feet. Yep. To have additional dwellings on there, you have to have another 30. So, essentially, you have to have at least two lots. In the village in order to do it's, that. It's and, still only 7,000 square feet. Yes. Uh, but With no additional parking, too. That was the other thing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why we, we put an asterisk on here is because the minimum lot size in the village district is approximately one twelfth of what it is of, of one acre. Right. And so one acre developments are not likely to occur. Half acre developments may not even be likely to occur. But if you do that, it could handle up to five units currently and up to 12 under the proposed regulation. And to speak to your concern about septic spruce, this, these, this amendment simply increases the density limits. It does not relax any of the other rules that are currently in our zoning ordinance when it comes to things like septic systems. And so one of the reasons I asked Mark here this evening is so he could speak to this if need be, but if someone wants to develop this sort of housing, they're going to have to still meet all the requirements for septics that currently exist in the ordinance. Otherwise, they don't get Well, permit. in the village, it would be public water and sewer. Oh, you're, you're right. correct about that. Okay. I, and if we're going to have development opened up, then we should have development zones within our community, Turkey Lane, something like that, yeah. where the developer is going to provide the plumbing and sewer Again, on the down system, so that million dollar a mile thing that public works likes to say is kind of for naught, you know, because the developer would cover those costs and right. booking it up. I just think that, you know, if I'm a intuitive homeowner and I have a double lot, I can see the opportunity where I don't have to go to the bank. I don't have to carry a mortgage on it. I can put three tiny houses up on my house or in my lots and I'd be within the time frame of the ordinance. Yes, but the economics still come into play and in that you got to have the financing available in order to provide a rental unit for no more than 30% of what someone who earns 80% of the area median income would pay. And so it it's... What, what is that so, so, so in order to do that affordable housing, it's a lot less lucrative than if you just built, built a single home and just sold it at, at market value. It's 30% of 80000 a year, median income or anything? Uh, I mean, something like that. that. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so it depends on the size of the household, yeah. uh, Roy. But let's just say like a three-member household. Okay? So 80% of uh, that for our area would be $52,000 for a two-person household, which may be one income, but it may be two incomes. And yet 30% of that is all they can charge for rent? Essentially. Yes. Cool. Which is $1,300 more. Let's, let's get back well, to our tech number here. I think we got to back up to Shannon. Oh, no. No? You're no. good? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Ruth, anything else? No, I just, uh, I'm unclear on those. Uh, and I'd like to get clarification before we move forward with it. Okay. James. So, so, so Bruce, would you say clarification? On I, I, I'm just concerned about the 3,500 square foot. Somebody that just wants to invest in a couple properties and stick them on an extra lot. And doesn't care, but you know, and then he could. It doesn't say you have to rent the low income properties, correct? Affordable <coughs> housing is house. different than no. no. Yes. So, but if, if I want to build two houses on my lot, yeah. then there should be nothing, and I'm going to finance it myself. I can charge whatever I want to for rent. But I can still put them in under the ordinance. No, it has to be affordable housing. So if it's not affordable housing, then the, then the density bonus does not apply. So who, who monitors whether this is being rented as affordable housing or not? Funding. Yeah. Please. The state is providing mechanism. Um, I don't know what that is, but in this well, place, they, they have indicated the they're going to help us with that. 
So there's going to be a mechanism in place, and ultimately, I do believe the town is going to play a big role in that. Um, I'm not sure how. So exactly should we have works. that set up before we before we get involved? Get involved yeah. in this. And where does the Airbnb? My other question is, where does the Airbnb situation? That would be a separate. I, I like separate. that. Right? Be a separate yeah. policy. Yeah. So that's that's not a portable house. But who's but monitoring? There. All right. So oh. next, we got James. Do we want to answer that? Well, we can it. not yeah. that. Yeah. It's not regulated. We're not regulating the Airbnb. Yeah. You can't regulate those. No you Portland, well, okay. Portland, Portland did come up with a policy for that where the people yeah. who are renting yeah, you would have, to have, have to live on the property. Yeah. 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 My whole point is if you if these people are building these houses under this, getting the permits under the affordable housing, mm -hmm. who is regulating the fact that they are actually renting it as affordable housing and not building it as affordable housing? And then renting it as an Airbnb. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You're right. Getting it permitted and 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 passed under affordable housing, but aren't actually renting it as an Airbnb. Yeah. So, so as Don said, I mean, at this point, it's a, it's a, it's a state responsibility. And I know I know the question you're going to ask, but but here's the thing, Roy, is that this is as I explained. Uh, in a couple of different emails and in this memo, this is the state expressly preempting our home rule authority. They're saying we don't have a choice in that. You will adopt this ordinance, and this ordinance is as skinny as it gets in providing for an affordable housing overlay district. Um, and so, so at some point, we're going to have to pass an ordinance that allows for this activity. And then we're going to have to work with the state just to ensure that the safeguards are in place to ensure that that people are living up to the the terms of the of the ordinance. Uh, can I add something to that? Please go ahead. Sure. Uh, it's very common in the subdivision process when the planning board is working with the applicant with the developer. There's all kinds of agreements that are made and um, you no know, regulations that are put in place that they're worked through. They might be put into homeowners association documents or they need. So those, there are tools that are created in an ongoing measure through the development process, the application process. So it would not be, in my experience, uncommon to be developing this so that it all comes together before the formal approval is granted at the end of the, of the review process. So it would be established. It would have to be established. I can't tell you exactly what that looks like right now, but it, they wouldn't be able to get approval until that was put in place and, and everyone declared how we would go forward and be forced to do so essentially we're being told we have to do something that the state doesn't quite have the regulations in place for yet. It's not uncommon for the state to pass regulations and then realize they're right. Like, like, they're 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 laws in the, in the legislation. It's like and and, and, and uh, again, as you know, I've tried to explain, this is really no different than shoreland zoning. Right? I mean, 50 years ago, the state passed a shoreland zoning statute that said every community with shore frontage in their community is going to have a shoreland zoning board. So I wasn't around, but I imagine there was some gnashing of teeth uh, about that at the time. And the reason for that is because the state recognized there was an overriding need to protect water bodies in the state. Right now, this preemptive, um, uh, the preemption of our home rule authority is being thrust upon us because the state says there's a housing crunch. We got to do something to address it. And this is the the, the tool that they're using in order to do that. So I I want you all to know when it's my turn. So I don't step on anybody. Yeah. Can I have the floor? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, James. So you're fine. Um, oh, yeah. Just to get a clear understanding, because I read a bunch of the material and I know Steve and Don's. And you can know right here is I'm just trying to understand and I'm writing some notes here. Bruce just made a point that I didn't, I didn't understand. It. So if it's not financed, they can build what they want. If it falls, it falls on this line and they can charge whatever they want for rent. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's part of But what is, can you give me clarification on that? So in order to qualify as affordable housing, you're serving households with an area with a median, you're serving a household whose income is no more than 80% of what the area median income is. So as I just explained, for a two-person household, that's $52,000 a year. Okay. And, and, to, 
I, I think we get that part. No, I mean, well, we're trying to, I mean, well, we're I trying to get that. Understand it. He's, he's clarifying his question. Let yeah, go ahead, James. Yeah. Okay, am I answering your question? Yeah, yeah, you can keep, keep, okay. keep going. And so, and so for that, for that, the rent of that unit could be no more, could consume no more than 30% of that two person's household, $52,000 in annual income. That, that helps there. The second, I never have more questions. What about if it's family? Does, I saw some stuff, garbage in there. It's a, it's a family member. If you're building a dwelling or having a dwelling. So that's separate and apart from the affordable housing. And in fact, there's a question on our uh, on our Zoom right now that says, isn't that the point of affordable housing build an ADU, accessory dwelling unit, and rent at the affordable housing level? No, an ADU is not affordable housing. And so, and so, but it's a tool right, that the state says you can, we want you to do this in order to help serve that, that the housing front. So, so for instance, Jim, instead of your mother-in-law having to have, you know, search for a house that fits her needs, right. they're saying you can build an ADU at your place. She can live there. And then her house is hopefully going to serve another family. So I can move in with Bruce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me continue on is really and hopefully Mark or Don maybe can look at this maybe hold on all this answer, but it's just popped in my head. How many lots are we talking about in that maybe even qualify for this that are in town? Which portion, the ADU or the affordable housing? Affordable housing. It, it seems like there's not a lot in town. But the ADUs. And do you have a figure on that one? Yeah. Well well every every lot. Can build an ADU. Okay. Yeah. All right. If it if it meets setbacks. Yes, it still has to meet all the regulation setbacks, septic capacity, all those things. But as long as it can meet what currently exists in the zoning ordinance, every every lot has the uh, opportunity to build an accessory dwelling. Okay. Does that have to be attached? No. no. So and then my last point is here is with the water and sewer. And it kind of goes on this because I'd like to see our water sort of expand. I mean, I can't express it enough. I, I, I know, but I'd love to see it because I, you know, we have a lot of properties that could serve this. But adding these things in town would put more people on the water and sewer. Hopefully, they would drive it and drive more revenue, correct? Which would potentially maybe give them revenue to make an expansion mm -hmm. outward. Theoretically. Correct. And that's all I want to do. Thank you. So, when an application is submitted to me, on water and sewer, okay. they are required to go to the utility district to get permission to make sure that it's just it sounds like it's pretty abundant and it's yeah. work. And it's the same follows for the ADU and subsurface. So, if you can picture somebody building on an ADU, it is a minimum of a two bedroom system. Uh, so, it's going to need its own separate tank. Or if not, it's going to add in line at least 750 gallons more tank capacity. So you're looking at probably two to two, two one thousand gallons of tank. So if those requirements can't be met, then the ADU can't be built because the subsurface is most important. Absolutely. And then the setback is the property line and such. So but that's why I'm in favor of just doing it where there is water and sewer because I just think that there's. But the ADUs, I don't think we can legally say that. no. Right now. Okay. They, but we could write an ordinance. Okay, well, less out. restrictive, but you can be more. So the more restrictive would not, you, you would not, if a single family can be placed on this property and an ADU could be built, you can't tell them no. Basically what the state is saying. It's not, I'll be honest, the CEO of the world and the MDOIAs are not in favor of this. But okay, well, I understand. It just takes the local control away from Common sense. <laughs> so it is what it is. So we have to kind of we have to deal with it. Uh, I have two things. One is to kind of drill down on Bruce's question: Can you build that dwelling unit on thirty five hundred square feet and pay for it, and then not have it be an affordable housing? Once an area it's zoned for a thirty five hundred square square foot lot with a dwelling unit on it. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there's a piece a place where we're going to. Be able to form 3,500 square foot lots as long as they meet setbacks and subsurface wastewater. Um, they may not. They may not be regulated. If, if you don't have no a lot, it'd be no different than how we're operating today, except for the 3,500 square foot lot. 
No, the 3,500 square foot lot is the minimum lot size in the village. Right. So you today, you can, it, but you could go outside of it. What do you mean you could go outside? You don't have to put that in the village. Well, if, you, if you're not building in the village zone, then your minimum lot size increases. So it depends upon which zone. And I, I guess I'm wondering how many people that actually have residential homes in the village. So I want to see their neighbors add a, an, an affordable housing here. Um, and, and I, I'm not going to say any more of this, I yeah. promise, but I... Can I, can I just don't, ask something? Uh, I, to next. your point, for Rory, I, about you know the Airbnbs and everything, and how can we ensure that these, this is affordable housing? Maybe we ask Craig or Tavis to put a, a bill in next year right. to clarify that these folks have to report if, in fact, they are abiding by the, that affordable housing requirement. Right. I think yeah. they. I think they ought to. They they have this. They have that designation. They ought to report. They have to report, and they have to say, "Okay, this is what we're charging for rents." There's got to be something in place. I mean, that's that's only fair. It'll probably land up. There's got to be some sort of accountability. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we that's can't. For there, the will state to out. there will be. There will be. The state has said they will help the town create that mechanism. It's part of the legislation. I just don't know what that looks like. But they had said they oh, so we have authority to, to, to make sure that that happens. They oh, said, yeah. okay, then so that's fine. And, I can't tell you the specific right. it doesn't look great. Okay, I know. And, and just to clarify, Andy, just speak to your point the minimum lot size in the village is 3,500 square feet. Yeah. You can't build a home in the general residential district on 3,500 square feet. The minimum lot size <laughs> in the general residential is 30,000 square feet, nearly 10 times the size. So, oh. so, so I think. The scenario that you were envisioning is not a show. You think that's good? No, I no, I don't think it. I know. Just I, I can say quickly addressing that in the village zone, there are not a lot of lots that would even remotely consider a second dwelling. They're just they're super tiny. Setbacks would limit it. You have to you have to meet the setbacks. <laughs> That would, I mean, a 3,500 square lot to have another, a uh, whole other dwelling there, I would think setbacks would be pretty common. Well, and not only that, but, you know, public water distribution. Yeah. So, it, also, right, so, it also requires that no additional parking right. is added, so they yeah. can't, like, yeah. put a new driveway in that parking area out behind their building. Well, it doesn't mandate that additional parking right. is right. added. Right. They don't have to have additional parking. They can if they want to, though, right? Right. All right. So we've had a whole lot of discussion without a motion. Usually we have a motion and second and discussion. So but I would like to see a motion on 219. Well, are we done with discussion? Is the public no, we get a discussion after the public hearing. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there's a gentleman on the line. Has okay. Where, where do you all want to hear from him first? Or do you yeah, want sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, Tim Adams. Hey. hey, everyone, this is Tim. Uh, I, I did just have a quick question. I heard a lot of talk about um, the density bonuses and stuff like that for this thing. Uh, and I'm just kind of curious what the incentives are. Is this something that towns get a kickback from the state for? Or is this something that homeowners that say, I want to provide affordable housing to people? Is this something that they get a tax break on? Is this something that they also benefit from? Uh, I'm just kind of curious, you know, what what's kind of like what Bruce and Roy were saying, like what's to keep someone from renting their tiny house at full market rate? Okay, so so again, there's a distinction between affordable housing and accessory dwelling units. So the tiny house is not the affordable housing, just to be clear. And um, I'm sorry, Tim, what well, Oh, as far as kickbacks, the town is not receiving any sort of kickback. We, if, if developments are built, then we will recognize the property tax revenue uh, that that would generate. And um, uh, and as far as I know, there is only one subsidy program provided through main housing for affordable uh, or main housing yet yeah, for affordable housing developments, and it limits the development to no more than eighteen units. And and again, these. If you're getting that subsidy, you're going to be monitored by main housing to ensure that you are actually serving households that earn 80% or less of the median area of income and that you're charging those folks no more than 30% of what their, their annual income is on their house costs. Does that answer your question, Tim? 
Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Okay, is there any further comments from uh, members of the public? Okay, the chair will entertain a motion on 219. I move to approve. Hold on. You have to get this in order. Thank you. Um, we just, am I, okay. I move to approve the proposed amendments to the town's tax acquired property policy as presented. I think you're under the wrong you're, 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 That's what you're 292. 292. 292. Okay, sorry. Uh, I move to approve on second reading zoning ordinance amendments to meet the requirements of LD 2003 as presented. So move. I mean, uh, second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any further discussion? Just to, just to clarify, again, we are still talking about that overlay. I don't want to get any confusion. We're not talking about, we're talking about that amended overlay. Yeah. So, so, so there, there are passing it. Yeah, we have the same thing yeah. last was so, so, right, so there are three components of the gem. Let me make sure that these correct. So there'll be affordable housing overlay increasing the density bonus. There's an allowing the accessory dwelling units by right, and two to four housing units per lot where housing is permitted. Which which I think Mark right now, the am I correct and Don, the standard is you can have. Two unit, yes. two dwellings yeah. on, a, on a lot of work. Yeah, under our current time. We have the, we have the second reading, but we don't have approval of the actual. We have to approve last time. Okay. Yeah. It was, but we did, the, the second reading failed. Did so we vote on it? We did. It, it approved the waiving we, last we, time failed. Right. We waived the second waiving. reading. Failed, right? Right. So here we are, just doing that portion. Okay. I am. The only thing I have to say is, this has been in the works since May or April of 2022, and now we're in a big rush to get it done. I'm not very pleased about that. Um, and also, I find that in the process of doing it, a significant portion of the intent of the 2010 comprehensive plan for the and that would have been to uh, build lots in more rural, small lots in more rural areas um, and expand the water and soil. So I'm going to go against this. Okay, if you have no further comment. Got a second. Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a, we're going to vote? Motion and second. We already had a motion. Okay. All in favor? Okay. You get that? All against? Okay, moving along. Item 220. Discussion and consideration of amending the town's tax acquired property policy. Hopefully we can get a straight up motion on this one. Can you give me some background on what we're changing? Sure. So, uh, so, so the town had a tax acquired property policy, and we just need to amend that policy in order to conform with the new state law that says we're going to sell your foreclosed properties. This is how you go about it. Okay. And so the changes to this are all meant to reflect the new state law. So we did seek input from Darren Hatching, who is our new. Uh, real estate broker yep. had the town's attorney uh, review the changes and he has uh, blessed those. And so uh, once we adopt this policy, then we can issue those 90 day uh, notices Perfect. that we're going to sell those two foreclosed properties that we have. But additionally, at our next meeting, we're going to seek to repeal the disbursement of funds from tax acquired property ordinance, which this council passed in 2016, because that ordinance is in conflict with the new state law. So the new state law supersedes that ordinance. And so, but we, uh, our attorney advised us that before we move forward on selling those two foreclosed properties, we needed the policy to reflect what the new law is. What's the, uh, 
you contracted with Homestead. Yes. Um, were there any other firms in the area that wanted to? No, we only got one one proposal for okay, the okay. RFP. Yep. And what what's the percentage? Uh, it depends upon the property, but we're not paying the percentage. So that comes, the proceeds. that comes from the proceeds that will go to the prior owner. We're due whatever is owed to us in taxes. Oh, that's and, right. And that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I remember that. Right. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a motion, please, to uh, approve the amendments to the town tax acquired property policy as presented. Okay, we second. have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. I'll give Elizabeth. that one to Elizabeth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. All, yeah. all right. And all that are in favor of that? We're all in favor. Anthony. Okay. Item 221 consideration of disbursement warrants. Okay. Chair, I want to take a motion. I move to approve the uh, disbursement warrants as presented. Second. Okay. All in favor. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Director so all are in favor? Okay, uh, 222, item 222. Consider of recommendations from the appointments committee. Did I skip one? No. No, I just wondered why do, why do we all have to vote on it when only if you, uh, half of us see it? Because, the because state law requires that the council vote on it. All right, that's, a, that's another one of those. You can't see it. State state law. Law. I'll yeah. share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's light breathing. <laughs> nobody, no one well, insults anybody, but just Lynn is chasing me around here. And uh, item 222 uh, suggests motion. I'll move to confirm the recommendation of the appointments committee to appoint Corinne Murchu LeBlanc to the Conservation Committee. Second. All in favor? All are in favor. Let's do all of them. Just all the names. Yeah. They're under the same motion. So the next one. Uh, okay. I move to confirm the recommendation of the appointments committee to appoint Ellen O'Brien to the Village Revitalization Committee. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. All in favor. <laughs> Record show. All in favor. Okay. I move that we confirm the recommendation of the appointments committee to appoint Penny Craig to the Village Revitalization Committee and to move. To confirm the recommendation of the appointments committee to appoint Gal Susi to the village revitalization committee. Okay. I second. <laughs> okay. Second. Bruce, okay. All in favor? The record show all in favor. Okay. Other business? Nothing I can think of. I do have one quick thing. Can you, uh, I'm asking of Anthony, can you explain that a little bit better about this whole? Um, elevator ordeal at the library. I wouldn't call it an ordeal, boy. Well, it's a, it's an RFP that went out. It was my understanding yeah. that every that uh, everything we already had a uh, a a quote. Uh, it was my understanding that we we were trying to uh, approve or uh, approve additional funds as a contingency. Uh, it was uh, also my understanding that well, we, we were well beyond the RFP or design stages of this elevator. I guess I, I guess I misunderstood that all our day. I, I did too. Uh, yeah, I did too. Yeah. In agreement with Roy, I, I missed it too. Okay. I thought that was all set. So then, then our apologies. So so what happened was the two hundred thousand dollars from ARPA that was approved that was based on an estimate from our architect of what the project will cost, and then the recommendation was we have ten percent contingency for that. But the project still, as you can imagine, when you're demolition, demolishing a, uh, an elevator and then you're installing a new elevator, that requires blueprints. And so we needed an architect to actually draft the blueprints. He put together the RFP for us. Now we're looking at searching for someone who's actually going to do the project for us. Okay, so we didn't even have anybody to do it at that point. No. I, I, I think several of us got the impression that there had been an RFP and estimate and the work would progress. Yeah, we were lined out to get started. Oh, wait, so, so you guys are always going to approve every RFP, especially. I mean, the yeah, well, this the all started though before we had the before we were doing the policy. Yeah, yeah, but but even so, I mean, two hundred thousand dollars. I can't. I mean, I can't speak to what happened before me. I would never spend two hundred thousand dollars without you guys voting okay. on it and approving a contract. Yeah. So right now we haven't done anything, and we're going to put this out the bid. We're, we have put it out for bid. 
uh, at our architect's suggestion, proposals are due no later than March the 1st. He felt like we needed that long of a timeline in order to get for someone to submit, to go over the plans and submit a bid. And then the plan is to have the project done by October 1st of 2024. Has, whoa, just a question. I, I mean, what about ADA compliance currently at the library? It's inaccessible? Uh, it's, prob it's problematic at best. So the uh, the, the lift works mm -hmm. sporadically. Even when they have in place now. Mm -hmm. Okay. October is what, nine months away? Did I get that wrong? Uh, yeah, I think there's uh, 11 months. Before. Yeah, 11 months. That's too long. Exist. There's no do, need to that. You can only do so many things so fast. That's right. <laughs> you're, you're, you know? Here's the problem. Yeah. You know, the October date is realistic. We just looked into an elevator and it was almost eight months from the yeah. time we placed the order and paid for it until it could actually right. be delivered. Could be right. Rich, Richard did try I to get to test out the elevator that's there. The project no, the I wasn't getting already there. rolling. Well, the ball was rolling. With the, but, but, with but the, not as far as having a contract. Right there. All right. All right. All right. So now I'll look back where we're at. Um, we okay. need to check to see if anyone from the garden club is online. Okay. Hey, Andy. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody? Yeah. I'm mean, having my hand up. We're trying to find a policy. I'd like to talk comment on what we're talking about with the elevator stuff. Oh, okay, go ahead. Just kind of help me wind it back. And I, I thought I was confused too, but thanks for the clarification. Didn't we also vote on some contingency money on this where we didn't even have a bid then? You did. And so well, I did. I voted against it. Okay. But <laughs> that, I just want you guys to understand that. But I didn't understand why we're asking for more money when we don't even have a bid on this. Well, and, and understand, Jim, I mean, those funds are contingent. Sure, and, I understand. And, and, so, and so we budgeted $200,000. We, we budgeted $200,000. If the bid comes in at two two ten, then we've already got the funds. Uh, the right. But that, at that point, I'd really have somebody come back and say, this is the quote, this is what it's going to cost. And then if we needed extra money, that's when we should make the approval. That contingency money, not now. I mean, you see, the cart before the horse, are you? Well, you're giving it to launch saying the guy can't overbid it by 20%. Only well, the thing is, never tell the funds are the funds are available. What would you say? Yeah. So, $200,000 was the estimate that yes. we received on the project. Yeah. This is typical in construction 10% contingency on a large construction project like that. So, that's where the $20,000. But that's on the quote. Not on the estimate. No, it's on the estimates. I so what that twenty thousand is based on the estimate. We don't know what the quote is going to be. We'll find out sometime yeah. in the spring. And wasn't there also a timeline where we had to yeah, designate where we were going to put the ARPA funds that we had to run over on estimates? With the... Yes, but we're not there yet. Run over on a quote. That's a, a, you know you, oh, yeah. you would run over on an estimate. You don't run over on an estimate. You would run over on a quote. That's where you would need the contingency. Yeah. Roy's kind of right, but what, what happens is when an architect will estimate, contractor will quote, then they'll tear out a wall, find that something the architect didn't anticipate, and that becomes extra work. I understand that, but at that point, he's already quoted the work. Correct. Yeah, well, you know. So uh, in, the, in that scenario, I think what happens is a contractor comes to whoever and says, hey, the, yeah. listen, you know, yeah. I found this extra wall and this uh, cave to the old old yeah, they'll see the change. Yeah. <laughs> they'll see the change order and then we'll, and then we'll consider whether or not we yeah, have that change order. to be that guy. All right. Thank you. Let's move on. Yep. Let's move on. All right. So um, as I okay. mentioned to some of you. I need to, uh, can I just for a second, Anthony, can I ask if there's any representatives from the Garden Club? Okay, that's officially off. Okay, in the water. okay. so uh, public comment. Okay, that's off. Town manager's report, please. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned to some of you earlier, we had a visit last week from Katie Cog, the DEP, EPA, to look at the mill. They were thrilled at what they saw there. I think there's great potential in that mill. But the first thing that's got to happen is an environmental site assessment so that any developer who might come in there knows exactly what they're dealing with. And if they find anything that's terribly problematic, they'll help us rid that uh, that site of that. And so um, the EPA and the DEP all said, we're going to help you get this project done. We're going to help you with funding. And so 
that was really exciting. I mean, I was really excited to see how excited that they were about it because they, they study these things all the time. And I said, this is one of the best main bills that they that they've been in as far as the potential for redevelopment. So that was really exciting. Cool. At our next meeting on January the eighth, um, myself, the school superintendent, and the police chief are going to be here just to talk with you about the possibility of accepting Rambler Road as a town road. It is not currently a town road, and apparently there was a thought that it would that the specs of the road didn't meet uh, DOT standards. And when I contacted the DOT, they said there's no reason that can't be a town road, and the reason that we're wanting you to consider accepting it as a town road is that because because it's not a town road it's a private road the uh, police department cannot force a speed limit on that so so interesting so they're, they're wanting they're wanting to have a posted speed limit that is enforceable in order to ensure a safer i think i've seen the results of that a few times <laughs> so, so anyway, so we're gonna have that discussion. We're gonna have that discussion on January the eighth. Um, last week, I also met with Affinity LED, which did the uh, street light conversion for us. The LEDs. We're tapping into a program that they talked to the town about about three years ago. We're converting all of the lighting in all of our facilities to LED. It would be budget neutral. And once we realize the payoff on that, then there'd be a cost savings in electricity to the town. So, so. Worked on an RFP, sent it to Efficiency Maine today to have them review that and offer input, and we're planning on putting that out to, to bid as well. So it'll be very similar to what we're doing with the with the heat pump uh, conversion, and that it'll be budget neutral, and the town will be out of pocket. Uh, there's not even any upfront cost uh, to this specific program. As I mentioned uh, a little earlier, on January 8th, we also want to engage in a discussion on the designated growth area. So we'll have some, some folks from KD Cog here to speak to that. Uh, also on January 8th, we'll have the swearing in, of the re-swearing in of Councilman Weymouth, and the swearing at Councilman Weymouth begins immediately after. <laughs> and until morale improves. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Aaron White. So uh, what I'd like to do is do that here in a public forum, as opposed to what happens. So you get a... You know, a lot more recognition than you did uh, last time, Roy. Uh, and, and have a little brief reception here, a little punching cookies, and everyone can slap uh, Roy and Aaron on the back. <laughs> we and, uh, and, uh, and then, and then we can continue with the, the meeting. I'd also like to recognize uh, Elizabeth's service on the council if she will agree to briefly attend the meeting. And bring cookies. Not, but you can have the cookies today. I'll, I'll initiate a charm up and so to try to get her to, to come in. Can I ask a question end? about the, the Rambler Road? And yes. When the high school and middle sure. school were originally built, there was a, I don't know what the name of the street is. Charles Street. Charles, Charles, Charles Street. street. Yeah. Why, why can't we use Charles Street? And we'll let the uh, the police chief and the superintendent explain that. Well, it's, it's, it's shut off at the top. Yeah. Is it in writing? Um, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. they'll explain the dynamics there. So. There's a uh, gate right there where Charles Street stopped and Ramble Road stopped. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So also on January the eighth, uh, the okay. Wallace superintendent's here. He's going to talk about the uh, so just give you an overview of the uh, the Winthrop Public School budget. Um, it's not going to be a free picture, he says, and so he wants to give you folks uh, a heads up. It's never a free picture. Can we get? Can you request? From uh, Jim, a, a little information on the electric buses and uh, the status of them, why we are not using them. Okay, I'll ask. I see them being used. I've seen them used as well. I mean, yeah, they drive, I but I've been standing on the they're, sidewalk they're, and they drive they're off. down. I know, I know that they initially had some uh, windshield issue. It had nothing to do with the engines, it was windshields. So well, I can tell you that uh, when I dropped my son off at the school, Three or four days after that snowstorm, there was two of them still covered in snow. Yeah. So I'm just curious as to what's going on with them. Okay. Uh, also, I uh, thought we might start just start a discussion on if we want to consider some other uses of the Anabasa Cook building now that we've cleared out uh, a lot of the junk out of that building. So we'll have that discussion. Uh, on January 26th, the second meeting in January, um, 
you folks are going to get to engage in NIMS training, which is the National Incident Management Citizen Training. It is required. Mark loves it, I can tell. It is required <laughs> of all elected officials, and we need to be NIMS compliant so that if we need to apply for either MEMA or FEMA grants, that, that we're compliant. So we're getting it that day? We're getting it that day. So it'll be uh, uh, an hour and a half to two hour training. Someone from the Kennebec Valley uh, or Kennebec County Emergency Management Agency is going to be here to lead that training uh, of you guys. Can you please get as much notice? In advance, as much in advance, notice in advance as you can for that. If you're going to take up that chunk of time, I'm, I'm giving it right now. It's, it's, it's December uh, 21st, and then we're talking about January 22nd. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So the other thing that we need to do is also have, uh, and this was mentioned in our executive session, the community resilience forum, where we get folks to suggest how we might spend our fifty thousand dollar grant. For community resilience, I don't know if we want to try to engage in that that same night, given the length of uh, of the form, but so of the NIMS training. So you're talking about an hour and a half, two hours for that, and maybe another hour for the community resilience form. Can we start early, like six o'clock? That sounds good to me. Okay, I'd rather do that if we're going to give you a two hour yeah. training. That's yeah. that makes sense. Can I let that segue me into a subject? I had a brief conversation with Anthony. I had a little confusion about when we were going to start this meeting tonight. And it was just because so many memos were going back and forth. And then I got to thinking, why don't we start a regular, usually executive sessions only last half an hour and forever we were starting at six and then fiddle button around waiting. Um, you remember that? And so I ran this by Anthony. What, what happens if we start our regular meetings at 6.30 our executive sessions at six? And then those that don't have time to eat before the meetings get to get home early enough they aren't starving by the time they get there. I think a lot of people like the seven o'clock because if they get home from work, you know, you're, you're it, it's one thing if we have things, a lot of things on the agenda, but I think seven o'clock, that's what people think that they're going to come here. So I, I wouldn't change it. Okay. It's just an idea. Yeah. How about everybody else? Weigh in real quick. So we can get out of here. I'm okay with seven. It gives me a okay. chance to get home and see the kids before you spend all night. Okay. Here. We'll leave it at seven. Uh, that's one. Sorry. That one. One last thing, and that is I sent to you guys a proposed budget schedule. And the, the question that I asked about that was, do you want it? So when we did budget last year, you guys were only meeting once a month. And then we had special meetings for, for budget, right? Now we're meeting twice a month. So do you want to try to talk budget at each of our twice monthly meetings? Or do you want to schedule budget workshops meetings that are separate and apart from those two monthly meetings to focus just solely on, on the budget? We can add one, I think, a couple departments. We're going to need one. Yeah. So we say we're going to need to be separate meetings? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You want separate meetings? I think we should I stick to Mondays, though, so, because All that's right. the... We need to add some, something because like too many people over it. Yeah. yeah. I just think we should stick to Mondays, and we all know to be cautious about booking on Monday nights. Okay. So so with that, I will, uh, I'll send you a more firm kind of schedule. budget schedule. Yeah. I have one question for the manager's report. Um, where are you at on securing possibly a grant to get uh, a couple of charging stations for cars, either downtown or in other areas? So that will be one of the options that we will discuss at the Community Resilience Forum. Okay. Because at those funds, that's one of the options that we, one of the possibilities for using those funds, as is an open space plan and lots of other possibilities. It's part of the program. And, 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 and to keep in mind that, and, and I'm going to be next month after the Manchester Select Board meeting with their town manager, because they're also going to be a community resilience fund recipient. And if we can find some project that we can partner with them on, then our $50,000 grant all of a sudden becomes a $125,000 grant between the two communities. So there's, there's the possibility to get some additional funding. Okay, that's right. Important. All right, thank I, you very much, Anthony. Um, I just want to say something quickly. I hope that you do attend the next meeting. Yeah. But it has been wonderful me, uh, working with you on the council. Um, it's been really good and been fun. 
yes. pedal a bunch of times. I keep things live. <laughs> you do. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'd have to say that after knowing you for about 30 years, I just didn't quite know how <laughs> it was going to go. 30 sitting, years. Nice try, you, have. <laughs> you have. I've only been in the stem yeah. 23 years. Oh, well, so. close enough. When you hit 70, everything seems like 30 years ago. <laughs> I have, yeah. Second. I can't really entertain a motion to adjourn. So second. Second. We're out of here. We're out of here. Anyone like a cookie before you go? We have the last sprinkles here.